Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum Chapter 1 The Earthquake The train from Frisco was very late. It should have arrived at Hugson's signing at midnight, but it was already five o'clock, and the gray dawn was breaking in the east when the little train slowly rumbled up to the open shed that served for the station house. As it came to a stop, the conductor called out in a loud voice, Hugson siding! At once a little girl rose from her seat and walked to the door of the car, carrying a wicker suitcase in one hand and a round bird cage covered up with newspapers in the other, while a parasol was tucked under her arm. The conductor helped her off the car, and then the engineer started his train again, so that it puffed and groaned and moved slowly away up the track. The reason he was so late was because all through the night there were times when the solid earth shook and trembled under him, and the engineer was afraid that at any moment the rails might spread apart and an accident happen to his passengers, so he moved the cars slowly and with caution. The little girl stood still to watch until the train had disappeared around a curve, then she turned to see where she was. The shed at Huxon's siding was bare save for an old wooden bench, and did not look very inviting. As she peered through the soft gray light, not a house of any sort was visible near the station, nor was any person in sight. But after a while the child discovered a horse and buggy standing near a group of trees a short distance away. She walked toward it and found the horse tied to a tree and standing motionless, with his head hanging down almost to the ground. It was a big horse, tall and bony, with long legs and large knees and feet. She could count his ribs easily where they showed through the skin of his body, and his head was long and seemed altogether too big for him, as if it did not fit. His tail was short and scraggly, and his harness had been broken in many places and fastened together again with cords and bits of wire. The buggy seemed almost new, for it had a shiny top and side curtains. Getting around in front so that she could look inside, the girl saw a boy curled up on the seat, fast asleep. She set down the bird cage and poked the boy with her parasol. Presently he woke up, rose to a sitting position, and rubbed his eyes briskly. Uh, hello, he said, seeing her. Are you Dorothy Gale? Yes, she answered, looking gravely at his tousled hair and blinking gray eyes. Have you come to take me to Hugson's ranch? Of course, he answered. Train in? I couldn't be here if it wasn't, she said. He laughed at that, and his laugh was merry and frank. Jumping out of the buggy, he put Dorothy's suitcase under the seat and her bird cage on the floor in front. Canary birds? he asked. Oh, no, it's just Eureka, my kitten. I thought that was the best way to carry her. The boy nodded. Eureka's a funny name for a cat, he remarked. I named my kitten that because I found it, she explained. Uncle Henry says Eureka means I have found it. All right, hop in. She climbed into the buggy, and he followed her. Then the boy picked up the reins, shook them, and said, Get at. The horse did not stir. Dorothy thought he just wiggled one of his drooping ears, but that was all. Get up, called the boy again. The horse stood still. And perhaps, said Dorothy, if you untied him, he would go. The boy laughed cheerfully and jumped out. Guess I'm half asleep yet, he said, untying the horse. But Jim knows his business all right, don't you, Jim? Patting the long nose of the animal. Then he got into the buggy again and took the reins and the horse at once backed away from the tree, turned slowly around, and began to trot down the sandy road, which was just visible in the dim light. "'Thought that train would never come,' observed the boy. "'I've waited at that station for five hours.' "'We had a lot of earthquakes,' said Dorothy. "'Didn't you feel the ground shake?' "'Yes, but we're used to such things in California,' he replied. "'They don't scare us much. The conductor said it was the worst quake he ever knew.' "'Did he? Then it must have happened while I was asleep,' he said thoughtfully. "'How is Uncle Henry?' she inquired, after a pause, during which the horse continued to trot with long, regular strides. "'He's pretty well. He and Uncle Hugson have been having a fine visit.' "'Is Mr. Hugson your uncle?' she asked. "'Yes, Uncle Bill Hugson married your Uncle Henry's wife's sister. So we must be second cousins.' said the boy in an amused tone. I work for Uncle Bill on his ranch, 
and he pays me six dollars a month and my board. Isn't that a great deal? she asked doubtfully. Why, it's a great deal for Uncle Hugson, but not for me. I'm a splendid worker. I work as well as I sleep, he added with a laugh. What is your name? asked Dorothy, thinking she liked the boy's manner and the cheery tone of his voice. Not a very pretty one, he answered as if a little ashamed. My whole name is Zebediah, but folks just call me Zeb. You've been to Australia, haven't you? Yes, with Uncle Henry, she answered. We got to San Francisco a week ago, and Uncle Henry went right on to Huxon's ranch for a visit, while I stayed for a few days in the city with some friends we had met. How long will you be with us? he asked. Only a day. Tomorrow Uncle Henry and I must start back for Kansas. We've been away for a long time, you know, and we're anxious to get home again. The boy flicked the big bony horse with his whip and looked thoughtful. Then he started to say something to his little companion, but before he could speak, the buggy began to sway dangerously from side to side, and the earth seemed to rise up before them. Next minute there was a roar and a sharp crash, and at her side Dorothy saw the ground open in a wide crack and then come together again. Goodness! she cried, grasping the iron rail of the seat. What was that? That was an awful big quake, replied Zeb with a white face. It almost got us that time, Dorothy. The horse had stopped and stood firm as a rock. Zeb took the reins and urged him to go, but Jim was stubborn. Then the boy cracked his whip and touched the animal's flanks with it, and after a low moan of protest, Jim stepped slowly along the road. Neither the boy nor the girl spoke again for some minutes. There was a breath of danger in the very air, and every few moments the earth would shake violently. Jim's ears were standing erect upon his head, and every muscle of his big body was tense as he trotted toward home. He was not going very fast, but on his flanks specks of foam began to appear, and at times he would tremble like a leaf. The sky had grown darker again, and the wind made queer sobbing sounds as it swept over the valley. Suddenly there was a rending, tearing sound, and the earth split into another great crack just beneath the spot where the horse was standing. With a wild neigh of terror, the animal fell bodily into the pit, drawing the buggy and its occupants after him. Dorothy grabbed hold of the buggy top, and the boy did the same. The sudden rush into space confused them so that they could not think. Blackness engulfed them on every side, and in breathless silence they waited for the fall to end and crush them against jagged rocks or for the earth to close in on them again and bury them forever in its dreadful depths. The horrible sensation of falling, the darkness, and the terrifying noises proved more than Dorothy could endure, and for a few moments the little girl lost consciousness. Zeb, being a boy, did not faint, but he was badly frightened, and clung to the buggy seat with a tight grip, expecting every moment would be his last. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum The Glass City When Dorothy recovered her senses, they were still falling, but not so fast. The top of the buggy caught the air like a parachute or an umbrella filled with wind, and held them back so that they floated downward with a gentle motion that was not so very disagreeable to bear. The worst thing was their terror of reaching the bottom of this great crack in the earth, and the natural fear that sudden death was about to overtake them at any moment. Crash after crash echoed far above their heads, as the earth came together where it had split, and stones and chunks of clay rattled around them on every side. These they could not see, but they could feel them pelting the buggy top, and Jim screamed almost like a human being when a stone overtook him and struck his bony body. They did not really hurt the poor horse, because everything was falling together, only the stones and rubbish fell faster than the horse and buggy, which were held back by the pressure of the air, 
so that the terrified animal was actually more frightened than he was injured. How long this state of things continued, Dorothy could not even guess. She was so greatly bewildered. But by and by, as she stared ahead into the black chasm with a beating heart, she began to dimly see the form of the horse Jim, his head up in the air, his ears erect, and his long legs sprawling in every direction as he tumbled through space. Also turning her head, she found that she could see the boy beside her, who had until now remained as still and silent as she herself. Dorothy sighed and commenced to breathe easier. She began to realize that death was not in store for her after all, but that she had merely started upon another adventure, which promised to be just as queer and unusual as were those she had before encountered. With this thought in mind, the girl took heart and leaned her head over the side of the buggy to see where the strange light was coming from. Far below her she found six great glowing balls suspended in the air. The central and largest one was white and reminded her of the sun. Around it were arranged, like the five points of a star, the other five brilliant balls, one being rose-colored, one violet, one yellow, one blue, and one orange. This splendid group of colored suns sent rays darting in every direction, and as the horse and buggy with Dorothy and Zeb sank steadily downward and came nearer to the lights, the rays began to take on all the delicate tintings of a rainbow, growing more and more distinct every moment until all the space was brilliantly illuminated. Dorothy was too dazed to say much. But she watched one of Jim's big ears turn to violet and the other to rose, and wondered that his tail should be yellow and his body striped with blue and orange like the stripes of a zebra. Then she looked at Zeb, whose face was blue and whose hair was pink, and gave a little laugh that sounded a bit nervous. "'Isn't it funny?' she said. The boy was startled, and his eyes were big. Dorothy had a green streak through the center of her face, where the blue and yellow lights came together, and her appearance seemed to add to his fright. "'I I, I don't s s see anything th funny about it,' he stammered. Just then the buggy tipped slowly over upon its side, the body of the horse tipping also. But they continued to fall all together and the boy and girl had no difficulty in remaining upon the seat, just as they were before. Then they turned bottom side up, and continued to roll slowly over, until they were right side up again. During this time Jim struggled frantically, all his legs kicking the air, but on finding himself in his former position, the horse said in a relieved tone of voice, "'Well, that's better.' Dorothy and Zeb looked at one another in wonder. "'Can your horse talk?' she asked. "'Never knew him to before,' replied the boy. "'Those were the first words I ever said,' called out the horse, who had overheard them. "'And I can't explain why I happened to speak then. This is a nice scrape you've got me into, isn't it?' "'As for that, we are in the same scrape ourselves,' answered Dorothy, cheerfully. "'But never mind. Something will happen pretty soon.' "'Of course,' growled the horse, "'and then we shall be sorry it happened.' Zeb gave a shiver. All this was so terrible and unreal that he could not understand it at all, and so had good reason to be afraid. Swiftly they drew near to the flaming-colored suns and passed close beside them. The light was then so bright that it dazzled their eyes and they covered their faces with their hands to escape being blinded. There was no heat in the colored suns, however, and after they had passed below them, the top of the buggy shut out many of the piercing rays so that the boy and girl could open their eyes again. "'We've got to come to the bottom sometime,' remarked Zeb with a deep sigh. "'We can't keep falling forever, you know.' "'Of course not,' said Dorothy. "'We are somewhere in the middle of the earth.' and the chances are we'll reach the other side of it before long. But it's a big hollow, isn't it? Awful big, answered the boy. We're coming to something now, announced the horse. At this they both put their heads over the side of the buggy and looked down. Yes, 
There was land below them, and not so very far away, either. But they were floating very, very slowly, so slowly that it could no longer be called a fall, and the children had ample time to take heart and look about them. They saw a landscape with mountains and plains, lakes and rivers, very like those upon the earth's surface, but all the scene was splendidly colored by the variegated lights from the six suns. Here and there were groups of houses that seemed to be made of clear glass because they sparkled so brightly. "'I'm sure we are in no danger,' said Dorothy in a sober voice. "'We are falling so slowly that we can't be dashed to pieces when we land, and this country that we are coming to seems quite pretty.' "'We'll never get home again, though,' declared Zeb with a groan. "'Oh, I'm not so sure of that,' replied the girl. "'But don't let us worry over such things, Zeb. We can't help ourselves just now, you know, and I've always been told it's foolish to borrow trouble.' The boy became silent, having no reply to so sensible a speech, and soon both were fully occupied in staring at the strange scene spread out below them. They seemed to be falling right into the middle of a big city which had many tall buildings with glass domes and sharp-pointed spires. These spires were like great spear-points, and if they tumbled upon one of them they were likely to suffer serious injury. Jim the horse had seen these spires also, and his ears stood straight up with fear, while Dorothy and Zeb held their breaths in suspense. But, no, they floated gently down upon a broad, flat roof, and came to stop at last. When Jim felt something firm under his feet, the poor beast's legs trembled so much that he could hardly stand. But Zeb at once leaped out of the buggy to the roof, and he was so awkward and hasty that he kicked over Dorothy's birdcage, which rolled out upon the roof so that the bottom came off. At once a pink kitten crept out of the upset cage, sat down upon the glass roof, and yawned and blinked its round eyes. Oh, said Dorothy, that's Eureka. First time I ever saw a pink cat, said Zeb. Eureka isn't pink, she's white. It's this queer light that gives her that color. Where's my milk? asked the kitten, looking up into Dorothy's face. I'm most starved to death. Oh, Eureka, can you talk? Talk? Am I talking? Good gracious, I believe I am. Isn't it funny? asked the kitten. It's all wrong, said Zeb gravely. Animals ought not to talk, but even old Jim has been saying things since we had our accident. I can't see that it's wrong, remarked Jim in his gruff tones. At least it isn't as wrong as some other things. What's going to become of us now? I don't know, answered the boy, looking about him curiously. The houses of the city were all made of glass, so clear and transparent that one could look through the walls as easily as through a window. Dorothy saw, underneath the roof on which she stood, several rooms used for rest chambers, and even thought she could make out a number of queer forms huddled into the corners of these rooms. The roof beside them had a great hole smashed through it, and pieces of glass were lying scattered in every direction. A nearby steeple had been broken off short, and the fragments lay heaped beside it. Other buildings were cracked in places, or had corners chipped off from them, but they must have been very beautiful before these accidents had happened to mar their perfection. The rainbow tints from the colored suns fell upon the glass city softly, and gave to the buildings many delicate shifting hues which were very pretty to see. But not a sound had broken the stillness since the strangers had arrived, except that of their own voices. They began to wonder if there were no people to inhabit this magnificent city of the inner world. Suddenly a man appeared through a hole in the roof next to the one they were on, and stepped into plain view. He was not a very large man, but was well formed and had a beautiful face, calm and serene as the face of a fine portrait. His clothing fitted his form snugly, and was gorgeously colored in brilliant shades of green, which varied as the sunbeams touched them, but was not wholly influenced by the solar rays. 
The man had taken a step or two across the glass roof before he noticed the presence of the strangers, but then he stopped abruptly. There was no expression of either fear or surprise upon his tranquil face, yet he must have been both astonished and afraid, for after his eyes had rested upon the ungainly form of the horse for a moment, he walked rapidly to the furthest edge of the roof, his head turned back over his shoulder to gaze at the strange animal. "'Look out!' cried Dorothy, who noticed that the beautiful man did not look where he was going. "'Be careful or you fall off!' But he paid no attention to her warning. He reached the edge of the tall roof, stepped one foot out into the air, and walked into space as calmly as if he were on firm ground. The girl, greatly astonished, ran to lean over the edge of the roof and saw the man walking rapidly through the air toward the ground. Soon he reached the street and disappeared through a glass doorway into one of the glass buildings. How strange! she exclaimed, drawing a long breath. Yes, but it's a lot of fun, if it is strange, remarked the small voice of the kitten, and Dorothy turned to find her pet walking in the air a foot or so away from the edge of the roof. Come back, Eureka! she called in distress. You'll certainly be killed. I have nine lives, said the kitten, purring softly, as it walked around in a circle and then came back to the roof. But I can't lose even one of them by falling in this country, because I really couldn't manage to fall if I wanted to. Does the air bear up your weight? asked the girl. Of course. Can't you see? And again the kitten wandered into the air and back to the edge of the roof. It's wonderful, said Dorothy. Suppose we let Eureka go down to the street and get someone to help us, suggested Zeb, who had been even more amazed than Dorothy at these strange happenings. Perhaps we can walk on the air ourselves, replied the girl. Zeb drew back with a shiver. I wouldn't dare try, he said. Maybe Jim will go, continued Dorothy, looking at the horse. And maybe he won't, answered Jim. I have tumbled through the air long enough to make me contented on this roof. But we didn't tumble to the roof, said the girl. By the time we reached here we were floating very slowly, and I'm almost sure we could float down to the street without getting hurt. Eureka walks on the air all right. Eureka weighs only about half a pound, replied the horse in a scornful tone, while I weigh about half a ton. You don't weigh as much as you ought to, Jim, remarked the girl, shaking her head as she looked at the animal. You're dreadfully skinny. Oh, well, I'm old, said the horse, hanging his head despondently. And I've had lots of trouble in my day, little one. For a good many years I drew a public cab in Chicago, and that's enough to make anyone skinny. He eats enough to get fat, I'm sure, said the boy gravely. Do I? Can you remember any breakfast that I've had today? growled Jim, as if he resented Zeb's speech. None of us has had breakfast, said the boy, and in a time of danger like this it's foolish to talk about eating. Nothing is more dangerous than being without food, declared the horse with a sniff at the rebuke of his young master. And just at present no one can tell whether there are any oats in this queer country or not. If there are, they are liable to be glass oats. Oh, no, exclaimed Dorothy. I can see plenty of nice gardens and fields down below us, at the edge of this city, but I wish we could find a way to get to the ground. Why don't you walk? asked Eureka. I'm as hungry as the horse is, and I want my milk. Will you try it, Zeb? asked the girl, turning to her companion. Zeb hesitated. He was still pale and frightened, for this dreadful adventure had upset him and made him nervous and worried, but he did not wish the little girl to think him a coward, so he advanced slowly to the edge of the roof. Dorothy stretched out a hand to him, and Zeb put one foot out and let it rest in the air a little over the edge of the roof. It seemed firm enough to walk upon, so he took courage and put out the other foot. Dorothy kept hold of his hand and followed him, and soon they were both walking through the air, with the kitten frisking beside them. "'Come on, Jim,' called the boy. "'It's all right.'
Jim had crept to the edge of the roof to look over, and being a sensible horse and quite experienced, he made up his mind that he could go where the others did. So with a snort and a neigh and a whisk of his short tail, he trotted off the roof into the air, and at once began floating downward to the street. His great weight made him fall faster than the children walked, and he passed them on the way down, but when he came to the glass pavement, he alighted upon it so softly that he was not even jarred. "'Well, well,' said Dorothy, drawing a long breath. "'What a strange country this is!' People began to come out of the glass doors to look at the new arrivals, and pretty soon quite a crowd had assembled. There were men and women, but no children at all, and the folks were all beautifully formed and attractively dressed, and had wonderfully handsome faces. There was not an ugly person in all the throng. Yet Dorothy was not especially pleased by the appearance of these people, because their features had no more expression than the faces of dolls. They did not smile, nor did they frown, or show either fear, or surprise, or curiosity, or friendliness. They simply stared at the strangers, paying most attention to Jim and Eureka, for they had never before seen either a horse or a cat, and the children bore an outward resemblance to themselves. Pretty soon a man joined the group who wore a glistening star in the dark hair just over his forehead. He seemed to be a person of authority, for the others pressed back to give him room. After turning his composed eyes first upon the animals and then upon the children, he said to Zeb, who was a little taller than Dorothy, "'Tell me, intruder, was it you who caused the rain of stones?' For a moment the boy did not know what he meant by this question. Then he remembered the stones that had fallen with them and passed them long before they had reached this place. He answered, No, sir, we didn't cause anything. It was the earthquake. The man with the star stood for a time quietly thinking over this speech. Then he asked, What is an earthquake? I don't know, said Zeb, who was still confused. But Dorothy, seeing his perplexity, answered, it's a shaking of the earth. In this quake a big crack opened, and we fell through, horse and buggy and all, and the stones got loose and came down with us. The man with the star regarded her with his calm, expressionless eyes. The rain of stones has done much damage to our city, he said, and we shall hold you responsible for it unless you can prove your innocence. How can we do that? asked the girl. That I am not prepared to say. It is your affair, not mine. You must go to the house of the sorcerer, who will soon discover the truth. Where is the house of the sorcerer? the girl inquired. I will lead you to it. Come. He turned and walked down the street, and after a moment's hesitation, Dorothy caught Eureka in her arms and climbed into the buggy. The boy took his seat beside her and said, Get up, Jim. As the horse ambled along, drawing the buggy, the people of the glass city made way for them and formed a procession in their rear. Slowly they moved down one street and up another, turning first this way and then that, until they came to an open square in the center of which was a big glass palace, having a central dome and four tall spires on each corner. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum The Arrival of the Wizard The doorway of the glass palace was quite big enough for the horse and buggy to enter, so Zeb drove straight through it, and the children found themselves in a lofty hall that was very beautiful. The people at once followed and formed a circle around the sides of the spacious room, leaving the horse and buggy and the man with the star to occupy the center of the hall. "'Come to us, O Gwig!' called the man in a loud voice. Instantly a cloud of smoke appeared and rolled over the floor. Then it slowly spread and ascended into the dome, disclosing a strange personage seated upon a glass throne just before Jim's nose. 
He was formed just as were the other inhabitants of this land, and his clothing only differed from theirs in being bright yellow. But he had no hair at all, and all over his bald head and face and upon the backs of his hands grew sharp thorns like those found on the branches of rose bushes. There was even a thorn upon the tip of his nose, and he looked so funny that Dorothy laughed when she saw him. The sorcerer, hearing the laugh, looked toward the little girl with cold, cruel eyes, and his glance made her grow sober in an instant. "'Why have you dared to intrude your unwelcome persons into the secluded land of the Mangaboos?' he asked sternly. "'Cause we couldn't help it,' said Dorothy. "'Why did you wickedly and viciously send the rain of stones to crack and break our houses?' he continued. "'We didn't,' declared the girl. "'Prove it!' cried the sorcerer. "'We don't have to prove it,' answered Dorothy indignantly. "'If you had any sense at all, you'd know it was the earthquake. "'We only know that yesterday came a rain of stones upon us, "'which did much damage and injured some of our people. "'Today came another rain of stones, and soon after it you appeared among us.' "'By the way,' said the man with the star, looking steadily at the sorcerer, "'You told us yesterday that there would not be a second rain of stones.' Yet one has just occurred that was even worse than the first. What is your sorcery good for if it cannot tell us the truth? My sorcery does tell the truth, declared the thorn-covered man. I said there would be but one rain of stones. This second one was a rain of people and horse and buggy, and some stones came with them. Will there be any more rains? asked the man with the star. No, my prince. Neither stones nor people? No, my prince. Are you sure? Quite sure, my prince. My sorcery tells me so. And just then a man came running into the hall and addressed the prince after making a low bow. More wonders in the air, my lord, said he. Immediately the prince and all of his people flocked out of the hall into the street, that they might see what was about to happen. Dorothy and Zeb jumped out of the buggy and ran after them, but the sorcerer remained calmly in his throne. Far up in the air was an object that looked like a balloon. It was not so high as the glowing star of the six colored suns, but was descending slowly through the air, so slowly that at first it scarcely seemed to move. The throng stood still and waited. It was all they could do, for to go away and leave that strange sight was impossible, nor could they hurry its fall in any way. The earth children were not noticed, being so near the average size of the Mangaboos, and the horse had remained in the house of the sorcerer, with Eureka curled up asleep on the seat of the buggy. Gradually the balloon grew bigger, which was proof that it was settling down upon the land of the Mangaboos. Dorothy was surprised to find how patient the people were, for her own little heart was beating rapidly with excitement. A balloon meant to her some other arrival from the surface of the earth, and she hoped it would be someone able to assist her and Zeb out of their difficulties. In an hour the balloon had come near enough for her to see a basket suspended below it. In two hours she could see a head looking over the side of the basket. In three hours the big balloon settled slowly into the great square in which they stood, and came to rest on the glass pavement. Then a little man jumped out of the basket, took off his tall hat, and bowed very gracefully to the crowd of mangaboos around him. He was quite an old little man, and his head was long and entirely bald. Why, cried Dorothy in amazement, it's Oz! The little man looked toward her and seemed as much surprised as she was. But he smiled and bowed as he answered, Yes, my dear, I am Oz the Great, the Terrible, eh? And you are little Dorothy from Kansas. I remember you very well. Who did you say it was? whispered Zeb to the girl. It's the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Haven't you heard of him? Just then the man with the star came and stood before the wizard. Sir, said he, why are you here in the land of the Mangaboos? "'Didn't know what land it was, my son,' returned the other with a pleasant smile. 
And to be honest, I didn't mean to visit you when I started out. I live on top of the earth, your honor, which is far better than living inside it. But yesterday I went up in a balloon, and when I came down, I fell into a big crack in the earth caused by an earthquake. I had let so much gas out of my balloon that I could not rise again, and in a few minutes the earth closed over my head. So I continued to descend until I reached this place, and if you will show me a way to get out of it, I'll go with pleasure. Sorry to have troubled you, but it couldn't be helped. The prince had listened with attention, said he. This child, who is from the crust of the earth like yourself, called you a wizard. Is not a wizard something like a sorcerer? It's better, replied Oz promptly. One wizard is worth three sorcerers. Ah, you shall prove that, said the prince. We Mangaboos have at the present one of the most wonderful sorcerers that ever was picked from a bush. But he sometimes makes mistakes. Do you ever make mistakes? Never, declared the wizard boldly. Oh, Oz, said Dorothy, you made a lot of mistakes when you were in the marvelous land of Oz. Nonsense, said the little man, turning red, although just then a ray of violet sunlight was on his round face. Come with me, said the prince to him. I wish you to meet our sorcerer. The wizard did not like this invitation, but he could not refuse to accept it. So he followed the prince into the great domed hall, and Dorothy and Zeb came after them, while the throng of people trooped in also. There sat the thorny sorcerer in his chair of state, and when the wizard saw him he began to laugh, uttering comical little chuckles. <laughs> what an absurd creature! he exclaimed. He may look absurd, said the prince in his quiet voice, but he is an excellent sorcerer. The only fault I find with him is that he is so often wrong. I am never wrong, answered the sorcerer. Only a short time ago you told me there would be no more rain of stones or of people, said the prince. Well, what then? Here is another person descended from the air to prove you were wrong. One person cannot be called people, said the sorcerer. If two should come out of the sky, you might with justice say I was wrong. But unless more than this one appears, I will hold that I was right. Very clever, said the wizard, nodding his head as if pleased. I am delighted to find humbugs inside the earth just the same as on top of it. Were you ever with a circus, brother? No, said the sorcerer. You ought to join one, declared the little man seriously. I belong to Balaam and Barney's great consolidated shows, three rings in one tent, and a menagerie on the side. It's a fine aggregation, I assure you. What do you do? asked the sorcerer. I go up in a balloon, usually to draw the crowds to the circus. But I've just had the bad luck to come out of the sky, skip the solid earth, and land lower down than I intended. But never mind, it isn't everybody who gets a chance to see your land of the Gabazoos. Mangaboos, said the sorcerer, correcting him. If you are a wizard, you ought to be able to call people by their right names. Oh, I'm a wizard, you may be sure of that. Just as good a wizard as you are a sorcerer. That remains to be seen, said the other. If you are able to prove that you are better, said the prince to the little man, I will make you the chief wizard of this domain. Otherwise, what will happen otherwise? asked the wizard. I will stop you from living and forbid you to be planted, returned the prince. That does not sound especially pleasant, said the little man, looking at the one with the star uneasily. But never mind, I'll beat old Prickly all right. My name is Gwig said the sorcerer, turning his heartless, cruel eyes upon his rival. Let me see you equal the sorcery I am about to perform. He waved a thorny hand, and at once the tinkling of bells was heard, playing sweet music. Yet look where she would, Dorothy could discover no bells at all in the great glass hall. The Mangaboo people listened, but showed no great interest. It was one of the things Gwig usually did to prove he was a sorcerer. 
Now was the wizard's turn, so he smiled upon the assemblage and asked, Will somebody kindly loan me a hat? No one did, because the Mangaboos did not wear hats, and Zeb had lost his somehow in his flight through the air. Ahem, <clears throat> said the wizard, will somebody please loan me a handkerchief? But they had no handkerchiefs either. Very good, remarked the wizard. I'll use my own hat, if you please. Now, good people, observe me carefully. You see, there is nothing up my sleeve, and nothing concealed about my person. Also, my hat is quite empty. He took off his hat and held it upside down, shaking it briskly. Let me see it, said the sorcerer. He took the hat and examined it carefully, returning it afterward to the wizard. Now, said the little man, I will create something out of nothing. He placed the hat upon the glass floor, made a pass with his hand, and then removed the hat, displaying a little white piglet no bigger than a mouse, which began to run around here and there and to grunt and squeal in a tiny shrill voice. The people watched it intently, for they had never seen a pig before, big or little. The wizard reached out, caught the wee creature in his hand, and, holding it between one thumb and finger and its tail between the other thumb and finger, he pulled it apart, each of the two parts becoming a whole and separate piglet in an instant. He placed one upon the floor, so that it could run around, and pulled apart the other, making three piglets in all, and then one of these was pulled apart, making four piglets. The wizard continued this surprising performance until nine tiny piglets were running about at his feet, all squealing and grunting in a very comical way. Now, said the Wizard of Oz, having created something from nothing, I will make something nothing again. With this, he caught up two of the piglets and pushed them together so that the two were one. Then he caught up another piglet and pushed it into the first where it disappeared, and so one by one the nine tiny piglets were pushed together until but a single one of the creatures remained. This the wizard placed underneath his hat and made a mystic sign above it. When he removed his hat, the last piglet had disappeared entirely. The little man gave a bow to the silent throng that had watched him. And then the prince said in his cold, calm voice, You are indeed a wonderful wizard, and your powers are greater than those of my sorcerer. He will not be a wonderful wizard long, remarked Gwig. Why not? inquired the wizard. Because I am going to stop your breath, was the reply. I perceive that you are curiously constructed, and that if you cannot breathe, you cannot keep alive. The little man looked troubled. How long will it take you to stop my breath? he asked. About five minutes. I'm going to begin now. Watch me carefully. He began making queer signs and passes toward the wizard, but the little man did not watch him long. Instead, he drew a leather case from his pocket and took from it several sharp knives, which he joined together one after another, until they made a long sword. By the time he had attached a handle to this sword, he was having much trouble to breathe, as the charm of the sorcerer was beginning to take effect. So the wizard lost no more time, but leaping forward he raised the sharp sword, whirled it once or twice around his head, and then gave a mighty stroke that cut the body of the sorcerer exactly in two. Dorothy screamed and expected to see a terrible sight, but as the two halves of the sorcerer fell apart on the floor, she saw that he had no bones or blood inside of him at all, and that the place where he was cut looked much like a sliced turnip or potato. Why, he's vegetable, cried the wizard, astonished. Of course, said the prince, we are all vegetable in this country. Are you not vegetable also? No, answered the wizard. People on top of the earth are all meat. Will your sorcerer die? Certainly, sir. He is really dead now, and will wither very quickly. So we must plant him at once, that other sorcerers may grow upon his bush, continued the prince. 
What do you mean by that? asked the little wizard, greatly puzzled. If you will accompany me to our public gardens, replied the prince, I will explain to you much better than I can here the mysteries of our vegetable kingdom. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum The Vegetable Kingdom after the wizard had wiped the dampness from his sword and taken it apart and put the pieces into the leather case again, the man with the star ordered some of his people to carry the two halves of the sorcerer to the public gardens. Jim pricked up his ears when he heard they were going to the gardens and wanted to join the party, thinking he might find something proper to eat, so Zeb put down the top of the buggy and invited the wizard to ride with them. The seat was amply wide enough for the little man and the two children, and when Jim started to leave the hall, the kitten jumped upon his back and sat there quite contentedly. So the procession moved through the streets, the bearers of the sorcerer first, the prince next, then Jim drawing the buggy with the strangers inside of it, and last the crowd of vegetable people who had no hearts and could neither smile nor frown. The glass city had several fine streets, for a good many people lived there, but when the procession had passed through these it came upon a broad plain covered with gardens and watered by many pretty brooks that flowed through it. There were paths through these gardens, and over some of the brooks were ornamental glass bridges. Dorothy and Zeb now got out of the buggy and walked beside the prince, so that they might see and examine the flowers and plants better. Who built these lovely bridges? asked the little girl. No one built them, answered the man with the star. They grow. That's queer, said she. Did the glass houses in your city grow, too? Of course, he replied, but it took a good many years for them to grow as large and fine as they are now. That is why we are so angry when a rain of stones comes to break our towers and crack our roofs. Can you mend them? she inquired. No, but they will grow together again in time, and we must wait until they do. They first passed through many beautiful gardens of flowers, which grew nearest the city. But Dorothy could hardly tell what kind of flowers they were, because the colors were constantly changing under the shifting lights of the six suns. A flower would be pink one second, white the next, then blue or yellow and it was the same way when they came to the plants which had broad leaves and grew close to the ground. When they passed over a field of grass, Jim immediately stretched down his head and began to nibble. A nice country this is, he grumbled, where a respectable horse has to eat pink grass. It's violet, said the wizard, who was in the buggy. Now it's blue, complained the horse. As a matter of fact, I'm eating rainbow grass. How does it taste? asked the wizard. Not bad at all, said Jim. If they give me plenty of it, I'll not complain about its color. By this time the party had reached a freshly plowed field, and the prince said to Dorothy, This is our planting ground. Several mangaboos came forward with glass spades and dug a hole in the ground. Then they put the two halves of the sorcerer into it and covered him up. After that, other people brought water from a brook and sprinkled the earth. He will sprout very soon, said the prince, and grow into a large bush, from which we shall in time be able to pick several very good sorcerers. Do all your people grow on bushes? asked the boy. Certainly, was the reply. Do not all people grow upon bushes where you come from, on the outside of the earth? Not that I ever heard of. How strange! But if you will come with me to one of our folk gardens, I will show you the way we grow in the land of the Mangaboos. It appeared that these odd people, while they were able to walk through the air with ease, usually moved upon the ground in the ordinary way. There were no stairs in their houses, because they did not need them, but on a level surface they generally walked just as we do. The little party of strangers now followed the prince across a few more of the glass bridges and along several paths until they came to a garden enclosed by a high hedge. Jim had refused to leave the field of grass, 
where he was engaged in busily eating, so the wizard got out of the buggy and joined Zeb and Dorothy, and the kitten followed demurely at their heels. Inside the hedge they came upon row after row of large and handsome plants, with broad leaves gracefully curving until their points nearly reached the ground. In the center of each plant grew a daintily dressed mangaboo, for the clothing of all these creatures grew upon them and was attached to their bodies. The growing mangaboos were of all sizes, from the blossom that had just turned into a wee baby to the full-grown and almost ripe man or woman. On some of the bushes might be seen a bud, a blossom, a baby, a half-grown person, and a ripe one, but even those ready to pluck were motionless and silent, as if devoid of life. This sight explained to Dorothy why she had seen no children among the mangaboos, a thing she had until now been unable to account for. "'Our people do not acquire their real life until they leave their bushes,' said the prince. "'You will notice they are all attached to the plants by the soles of their feet, and when they are quite ripe they are easily separated from the stems and at once attain the powers of motion and speech. So while they grow they cannot be said to really live, and they must be picked before they can become good citizens.' "'How long do you live after you are picked?' asked Dorothy. "'That depends upon the care we take of ourselves,' he replied. "'If we keep cool and moist and meet with no accidents, we often live for five years. I've been picked over six years, but our family is known to be especially long-lived. "'Do you eat?' asked the boy. "'Eat? No, indeed. We are quite solid inside our bodies and have no need to eat any more than does a potato.' "'But the potatoes sometimes sprout,' said Zeb. "'And sometimes we do,' answered the prince. "'But that is considered a great misfortune, for then we must be planted at once.' "'Where did you grow?' asked the wizard. "'I will show you,' was the reply. "'Step this way, please.' He led them within another but smaller circle of hedge, where grew one large and beautiful bush. "'This,' said he, is the royal bush of the Mangaboos. All of our princes and rulers have grown upon this one bush from time immemorial. They stood before it in silent admiration. On the central stalk stood poised the figure of a girl so exquisitely formed and colored, and so lovely in the expression of her delicate features, that Dorothy thought she had never seen so sweet and adorable a creature in all her life. The maiden's gown was soft as satin, and fell about her in ample folds, while dainty lace-like traceries trimmed the bodice and sleeves. Her flesh was fine and smooth as polished ivory, and her poise expressed both dignity and grace. "'Who is this?' asked the wizard curiously. The prince had been staring hard at the girl on the bush. Now he answered with a touch of uneasiness in his cold tones. She is the ruler destined to be my successor, for she is a royal princess. When she becomes fully ripe, I must abandon the sovereignty of the Mangaboos to her. Isn't she ripe now? asked Dorothy. He hesitated. Not quite, said he finally. It will be several days before she needs to be picked, or at least that is my judgment. I am in no hurry to resign my office and be planted, you may be sure. Probably not, declared the wizard, nodding. This is one of the most unpleasant things about our vegetable lives, continued the prince with a sigh, that while we are in our full prime we must give way to another and be covered up in the ground to sprout and grow and give birth to other people. I'm sure the princess is ready to be picked, asserted Dorothy, gazing hard at the beautiful girl on the bush. She's as perfect as she can be. Never mind, answered the prince hastily. She will be all right for a few days longer, and it's best for me to rule until I can dispose of you strangers who have come to our land uninvited and must be attended to at once. What are you going to do with us? asked Zeb. That is a matter I have not quite decided upon, was the reply. 
I think I shall keep this wizard until a new sorcerer is ready to pick, for he seems quite skillful and may be of use to us. But the rest of you must be destroyed in some way, and you cannot be planted, because I do not wish horses and cats and meat people growing all over our country. You needn't worry, said Dorothy. We wouldn't grow underground, I'm sure. But why destroy my friends? asked the little wizard. Why not let them live? They do not belong here, returned the prince. They have no right to be inside the earth at all. We didn't ask to come down here. We fell, said Dorothy. That is no excuse, declared the prince coldly. The children looked at each other in perplexity, and the wizard sighed. Eureka rubbed her paw on her face and said in her soft, purring voice, He won't need to destroy me, for if I don't get something to eat pretty soon, I shall starve to death, and so save him the trouble. If he planted you, he might grow some cattails, suggested the wizard. Oh, Eureka, perhaps we can find you some milkweeds to eat, said the boy. Pooh, snarled the kitten. I wouldn't touch the nasty things. You don't need milk, Eureka, remarked Dorothy. You're big enough now to eat any kind of food. If I can get it, added Eureka. I'm hungry myself, said Zeb. But I noticed some strawberries growing in one of the gardens, and some melons in another place. These people don't eat such things, so perhaps on our way back they will let us get them. Never you mind your hunger, interrupted the prince. I shall order you destroyed in a few minutes, so you will have no need to ruin our pretty melon vines and berry bushes. Follow me, please, to meet your doom. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum Dorothy Picks the Princess The words of the cold and moist vegetable prince were not very comforting, and as he spoke them he turned away and left the enclosure. The children, feeling sad and despondent, were about to follow him when the wizard touched Dorothy softly on her shoulder. Wait, he whispered. What for? asked the girl. "'Suppose we pick the royal princess,' said the wizard. "'I'm quite sure she's right, and as soon as she comes to life, she will be the ruler, and may treat us better than that heartless prince intends to.' "'All right!' exclaimed Dorothy eagerly. "'Let's pick her while we have the chance, before the man with the star comes back.' So together they leaned over the great bush, and each of them seized one hand of the lovely princess. "'Pull!' cried Dorothy. And as they did so, the royal lady leaned toward them, and the stems snapped and separated from her feet. She was not heavy at all, so the wizard and Dorothy managed to lift her gently to the ground. The beautiful creature passed her hands over her eyes an instant, tucked in a stray lock of hair that had become disarranged, and after a look around the garden made those present a gracious bow and said, in a sweet but even-toned voice, I thank you very much. We salute your royal highness, cried the wizard, kneeling and kissing her hand. Just then the voice of the prince was heard calling upon them to hasten, and a moment later he returned to the enclosure, followed by a number of his people. Instantly the princess turned and faced him, and when he saw that she was picked, the prince stood still and began to tremble. Sir, said the royal lady with much dignity, you have wronged me greatly, and would have wronged me still more, had not these strangers come to my rescue. I have been ready for picking all the past week, but because you were selfish and desired to continue your unlawful rule, you left me to stand silent upon my bush. I did not know that you were ripe, answered the prince in a low voice. Give me the star of royalty, she commanded. Slowly he took the shining star from his own brow and placed it upon that of the princess. Then all the people bowed low to her, and the prince turned and walked away alone. What became of him afterward our friends never knew. The people of Mangaboo now formed themselves into a procession and marched toward the glass city to escort their new ruler to her palace and to perform those ceremonies proper to the occasion. 
but while the people in the procession walked upon the ground, the princess walked in the air just above their heads to show that she was a superior being and more exalted than her subjects. No one now seemed to pay any attention to the strangers, so Dorothy and Zeb and the wizard let the train pass on and then wandered by themselves into the vegetable gardens. They did not bother to cross the bridges over the brooks, but when they came to a stream they stepped high and walked in the air to the other side. This was a very interesting experience to them, and Dorothy said, I wonder why it is that we can walk so easily in the air. Perhaps, answered the wizard, it is because we are close to the center of the earth, where the attraction of gravitation is very slight. But I've noticed that many queer things happen in fairy countries. Is this a fairy country? asked the boy. Of course it is, returned Dorothy promptly. Only a fairy country could have vegetable people, and only in a fairy country could Eureka and Jim talk as we do. That's true, said Zeb thoughtfully. In the vegetable gardens they found the strawberries and melons and several other unknown but delicious fruits, of which they ate heartily. But the kitten bothered them constantly by demanding milk or meat, and called the wizard names because he could not bring her a dish of milk by means of his magical arts. As they sat upon the grass watching Jim, who was still busily eating, Eureka said, I don't believe you are a wizard at all. No, answered the little man, you are quite right. In the strict sense of the word, I am not a wizard, but only a humbug. The Wizard of Oz has always been a humbug, agreed Dorothy. I've known him for a long time. If that is so, said the boy, how could he do that wonderful trick with the nine tiny piglets? Don't know, said Dorothy, but it must have been humbug. Very true, declared the wizard, nodding at her. It was necessary to deceive that ugly sorcerer and the prince, as well as their stupid people. But I don't mind telling you, who are my friends, that the thing was only a trick. But I saw the little pigs with my own eyes, exclaimed Zeb. So did I, purred the kitten. To be sure, answered the wizard, you saw them, because they were there. They are in my inside pocket now. But the pulling of them apart and pushing them together again was only a sleight-of-hand trick. Let's see the pigs, said Eureka eagerly. The little man felt carefully in his pocket and pulled out the tiny piglets, setting them upon the grass one by one, where they ran around and nibbled the tender blades. They're hungry, too, he said. Oh, what cunning things, cried Dorothy, catching up one and petting it. Be careful, said the piglet with a squeal. You're squeezing me. Dear me, murmured the wizard, looking at his pets in astonishment. They can actually talk. May I eat one of them? asked the kitten in a pleading voice. I'm awfully hungry. Why, Eureka, said Dorothy reproachfully. What a cruel question. It would be dreadful to eat these dear little things. I should say so, grunted another of the piglets, looking uneasily at the kitten. Cats are cruel things. I'm not cruel, replied the kitten, yawning. I'm just hungry. You cannot eat my piglets even if you are starving, declared the little man in a stern voice. They are the only things I have to prove I'm a wizard. How do they happen to be so little? asked Dorothy. I never saw such small pigs before. They are from the island of Tinty Winty, said the wizard where everything is small because it's a small island. A sailor brought them to Los Angeles, and I gave him nine tickets to the circus for them. But what am I going to eat? wailed the kitten, sitting in front of Dorothy and looking pleadingly into her face. There are no cows here to give milk, or any mice, or even grasshoppers. And if I can't eat the piglets, you may as well plant me at once and raise ketchup. I have an idea, said the wizard, that there are fishes in these brooks. Do you like fish? Fish, cried the kitten. Do I like fish? Why, they're better than piglets, or even milk. Then I'll try to catch you some, said he. But won't they be vegetable like everything else here? asked the kitten. I think not. Fishes are not animals, and they are as cold and moist as the vegetables themselves. There is no reason that I can see why they may not exist in the waters of this strange country. Then the wizard bent a pen for a hook, 
and took a long piece of string from his pocket for a fish line. The only bait he could find was a bright red blossom from a flower. But he knew fishes are easy to fool if anything bright attracts their attention, so he decided to try the blossom. Having thrown the end of his line in the water of a nearby brook, he soon felt a sharp tug that told him a fish had bitten and was caught on the bent pin, so the little man drew in the string, and sure enough, the fish came with it and was landed safely on the shore, where it began to flop around in great excitement. The fish was fat and round, and its scales glistened like beautifully cut jewels set close together. But there was no time to examine it closely, for Eureka made a jump and caught it between her claws, and in a few moments it had entirely disappeared. "'Oh, Eureka!' cried Dorothy. "'Did you eat the bones?' "'If it had any bones, I ate them,' replied the kitten composedly, as it washed its face after the meal. "'But I don't think that fish had any bones, because I didn't feel them scratch my throat.' "'You were very greedy,' said the girl. "'I was very hungry,' replied the kitten. The little pigs had stood huddled in a group, watching this scene with frightened eyes. "'Cats are dreadful creatures,' said one of them. "'I'm glad we are not fishes,' said another. "'Don't worry,' Dorothy murmured soothingly. "'I'll not let the kitten hurt you.' Then she happened to remember that in a corner of her suitcase were one or two crackers that were left over from her luncheon on the train, and she went to the buggy and brought them. Eureka stuck up her nose at such food, but the tiny piglets squealed delightedly at the sight of the crackers and ate them up in a jiffy. "'Now let us go back to the city,' suggested the wizard. "'That is, if Jim has had enough of the pink grass.' The cab-horse, who was browsing near, lifted his head with a sigh. "'I've tried to eat a lot while I had the chance,' said he. "'For it's likely to be a long while between meals in this strange country. But I'm ready to go now at any time you wish.' So after the wizard had put the piglets back into his inside pocket, where they cuddled up and went to sleep, the three climbed into the buggy, and Jim started back to the town. "'Where shall we stay?' asked the girl. "'I think I shall take possession of the house of the sorcerer,' replied the wizard, for the prince said in the presence of his people that he would keep me until they picked another sorcerer, and the new princess won't know but that we belong there. They agreed to this plan, and when they reached the great square, Jim drew the buggy into the big door of the domed hall. "'It doesn't look very homelike,' said Dorothy, gazing around at the bare room. "'But it's a place to stay, anyhow.' "'What are those holes up there?' inquired the boy, pointing at some openings that appeared near the top of the dome. "'They look like doorways,' said Dorothy. "'Only there are no stairs to get to them.' "'You forget that stairs are unnecessary,' observed the wizard. "'Let us walk up and see where the doors lead to.' With this he began walking in the air toward the high openings, and Dorothy and Zeb followed him. It was the sort of climb one experiences when walking up a hill and they were nearly out of breath when they came to the row of openings, which they perceived to be doorways leading into halls in the upper part of the house. Following these halls, they discovered many small rooms opening from them, and some were furnished with glass benches, tables, and chairs, but there were no beds at all. "'I wonder if these people never sleep,' said the girl. "'Why, there seems to be no night at all in this country,' Zeb replied. Those colored suns are exactly in the same place they were when we came, and if there is no sunset, there can be no night. Very true, agreed the wizard, but it is a long time since I have had any sleep, and I am tired, so I think I shall lie down upon one of these hard glass benches and take a nap. I will, too, said Dorothy, and chose a little room at the end of the hall. Zeb walked down again to unharness Jim, who, when he found himself free, rolled over a few times and then settled down to sleep, with Eureka nestling comfortably beside his big bony body. Then the boy returned to one of the upper rooms, and in spite of the hardness of the glass bench, was soon deep in slumberland. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum the Mangaboos proved dangerous. 
When the wizard awoke, the six colored suns were shining down upon the land of the Mangaboos just as they had done ever since his arrival. The little man, having had a good sleep, felt rested and refreshed, and looking through the glass partition of the room, he saw Zeb sitting up on his bench and yawning, so the wizard went in to him. Zeb, said he, my balloon is of no further use in this strange country, so I may as well leave it on the square where it fell, but in the basket car are some things I would like to keep with me. I wish you would go and fetch my satchel, two lanterns, and a can of kerosene oil that is under the seat. There is nothing else that I care about. So the boy went willingly upon the errand, and by the time he had returned Dorothy was awake. Then the three held a council to decide what they should do next, but could think of no way to better their condition. "'I don't like these vegetable people,' said the little girl. "'They're cold and flabby, like cabbages, in spite of their prettiness.' "'I agree with you. It is because there is no warm blood in them,' remarked the wizard. "'And they have no hearts, so they can't love anyone, not even themselves,' declared the boy. "'The princess is lovely to look at,' continued Dorothy thoughtfully. "'But I don't care much for her, after all. If there was any other place to go, I'd like to go there.' "'But is there any other place?' asked the wizard. "'I don't know,' she answered. Just then they heard the big voice of Jim the cab-horse calling to them, and going to the doorway leading to the dome they found the princess and a throng of her people had entered the house of the sorcerer. So they went down to greet the beautiful vegetable lady, who said to them, I have been talking with my advisers about you meat people, and we have decided that you do not belong in the land of Mangaboos and must not remain here. "'How can we go away?' asked Dorothy. "'Oh, you cannot go away, of course, so you must be destroyed,' was the answer. "'In what way?' inquired the wizard. "'We shall throw you three people into the garden of the twining vines,' said the princess, "'and they will soon crush you and devour your bodies to make themselves grow bigger. "'The animals you have with you we will drive to the mountains and put into the black pit.' Then our country will be rid of all its unwelcome visitors. But you are in need of a sorcerer, said the wizard, and not one of those growing is yet ripe enough to pick. I am greater than any thorn-covered sorcerer that ever grew in your garden. Why destroy me? It is true we need a sorcerer, acknowledged the princess, but I am informed that one of our own will be ready to pick in a few days to take the place of Gwig, whom you cut in two before it was time for him to be planted. Let us see your arts and the sorceries you are able to perform. Then I will decide whether to destroy you with the others or not. At this the wizard made a bow to the people and repeated his trick of producing the nine tiny piglets and making them disappear again. He did it very cleverly indeed and the princess looked at the strange piglets as if she were as truly astonished as any vegetable person could be. But afterward she said, I have heard of this wonderful magic, but it accomplishes nothing of value. What else can you do? The wizard tried to think. Then he jointed together the blades of his sword, and balanced it very skillfully upon the end of his nose, but even that did not satisfy the princess. Just then his eye fell upon the lanterns and the can of kerosene oil which Zeb had brought from the car of his balloon, and he got a clever idea from those commonplace things. "'Your Highness,' said he, "'I will now proceed to prove my magic by creating two suns that you have never seen before. Also I will exhibit a destroyer much more dreadful than your clinging vines.' So he placed Dorothy upon one side of him and the boy upon the other, and set a lantern upon each of their heads. Don't laugh, he whispered to them, or you will spoil the effect of my magic. Then, with much dignity and a look of vast importance upon his wrinkled face, the wizard got out his matchbook and lighted the two lanterns. The glare they made was very small when compared to the radiance of the six great colored suns but still they gleamed steadily and clearly. The Mangaboos were much impressed, because they had never before seen any light 
that did not come directly from their sons. Next the wizard poured a pool of oil from the can upon the glass floor, where it covered quite a broad surface. When he lighted the oil a hundred tongues of flame shot up, and the effect was really imposing. "'Now, princess,' exclaimed the wizard, "'those of your advisers who wished to throw me into the garden of clinging vines must step within this circle of light. If they advised you well and were in the right, they will not be injured in any way. But if any advised you wrongly, the light will wither him.' The advisers of the princess did not like this test, but she commanded them to step into the flame, and one by one they did so and were scorched so badly that the air was soon filled with an odor like that of baked potatoes. Some of the mangaboos fell down and had to be dragged from the fire, and all were so withered that it would be necessary to plant them at once. "'Sir,' said the princess to the wizard, "'you are greater than any sorcerer we have ever known, as it is evident that my people have advised me wrongly.' I will not cast you three people into the dreadful garden of the clinging vines, but your animals must be driven into the black pit in the mountain, for my subjects cannot bear to have them around. The wizard was so pleased to have saved the two children and himself that he said nothing against this decree, but when the princess had gone both Jim and Eureka protested they did not want to go to the black pit and Dorothy promised she would do all that she could to save them from such a fate. For two or three days after this, if we call days the periods between sleep, there being no night to divide the hours into days, our friends were not disturbed in any way. They were even permitted to occupy the house of the sorcerer in peace, as if it had been their own, and to wander in the gardens in search of food. Once they came near to the enclosed garden of the clinging vines, and, walking high into the air, looked down upon it with much interest. They saw a mass of tough green vines, all matted together and writhing and twisting around like a nest of great snakes. Everything the vines touched they crushed, and our adventurers were indeed thankful to have escaped being cast among them. Whenever the wizard went to sleep, he would take the nine tiny piglets from his pocket and let them run around on the floor of his room to amuse themselves and get some exercise, and one time they found his glass door ajar and wandered into the hall and then into the bottom part of the great dome, walking through the air as easily as Eureka could. They knew the kitten by this time, so they scampered over to where she lay beside Jim and commenced to frisk and play with her. The cab-horse, who never slept long at a time, sat upon his haunches and watched the tiny piglets and the kitten with much approval. "'Don't be rough,' he would call out, if Eureka knocked over one of the round, fat piglets with her paw. But the pigs never minded, and enjoyed the sport very greatly. Suddenly they looked up to find the room filled with the silent, solemn-eyed mangaboos, each of the vegetable folk bore a branch covered with sharp thorns, which was thrust defiantly toward the horse, the kitten, and the piglets. "'Here, stop this foolishness!' Jim roared angrily. But after being pricked once or twice, he got upon his four legs and kept out of the way of the thorns. The mangaboo surrounded them in solid ranks, but left an opening to the doorway of the hall, so the animals slowly retreated until they were driven from the room and out upon the street. Here were more of the vegetable people with thorns, and silently they urged the now frightened creatures down the street. Jim had to be careful not to step upon the tiny piglets, who scampered under his feet, grunting and squealing, while Eureka, snarling and biting at the thorns pushed toward her, also tried to protect the pretty little things from injury. Slowly but steadily the heartless mangaboos drove them on until they had passed through the city and the gardens and come to the broad plains leading to the mountain. "'What does all this mean, anyhow?' asked the horse, jumping to escape a thorn. "'Why, they're driving us toward the black pit, into which they threatened to cast us,' replied the kitten. "'If I were as big as you are, Jim, I'd fight these miserable turnip roots.' "'What would you do?' inquired Jim. I'd kick out with those long legs and iron-shod hoofs. 
All right, said the horse, I'll do it. An instant later he suddenly backed toward the crowd of mangaboos and kicked out his hind legs as hard as he could. A dozen of them smashed together and tumbled to the ground, and seeing his success, Jim kicked again and again, charging into the vegetable crowd, knocking them in all directions, and sending the others scattering to escape his iron heels. Eureka helped him by flying into the faces of the enemy and scratching and biting furiously, and the kitten ruined so many vegetable complexions that the mangaboos feared her as much as they did the horse. But the foes were too many to be repulsed for long. They tired Jim and Eureka out, and although the field of battle was thickly covered with mashed and disabled mangaboos, our animal friends had to give up at last and allow themselves to be driven to the mountain. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by old Frank Baum into the black pit and out again. When they came to the mountain it proved to be a rugged, towering chunk of deep green glass and looked dismal and forbidding in the extreme. Halfway up the steep was a yawning cave, black as night beyond the point where the rainbow rays of the colored suns reached into it. The mangaboos drove the horse and the kitten and the piglets into this dark hole and then, having pushed the buggy in after them, for it seemed some of them had dragged it all the way from the domed hall, they began to pile big glass rocks within the entrance, so that the prisoners could not get out again. "'This is dreadful,' groaned Jim. "'It will be the end of our adventures, I guess.' "'If the wizard was here,' said one of the piglets, sobbing bitterly, "'he would not see us suffer so.' We ought to have called him and Dorothy when we were first attacked, added Eureka. But never mind, be brave, my friends, and I will go and tell our masters where you are, and get them to come to your rescue. The mouth of the hole was nearly filled up now, but the kitten gave a leap through the remaining opening and at once scampered up into the air. The Mangaboos saw her escape, and several of them caught up their thorns and gave chase, mounting through the air after her. Eureka, however, was lighter than the Mangaboos, and while they could mount only about a hundred feet above the earth, the kitten found she could go nearly two hundred feet. So she ran along over their heads until she had left them far behind and below, and had come to the city and the house of the sorcerer. There she entered in at Dorothy's window in the dome and aroused her from her sleep. As soon as the little girl knew what had happened, she awakened the wizard and Zeb, and at once preparations were made to go to the rescue of Jim and the piglets. The wizard carried his satchel, which was quite heavy, and Zeb carried the two lanterns and the oil can. Dorothy's wicker suitcase was still under the seat of the buggy, and by good fortune the boy had also placed the harness in the buggy when he had taken it off of Jim to let the horse lie down and rest. So there was nothing for the girl to carry but the kitten, which she held close to her bosom and tried to comfort, for its little heart was still beating rapidly. Some of the mangaboos discovered them as soon as they left the house of the sorcerer, but when they started toward the mountain the vegetable people allowed them to proceed without interference, yet followed in a crowd behind them, so that they could not go back again. Before long they neared the Black Pit, where a busy swarm of mangaboos, headed by their princess, was engaged in piling up glass rocks before the entrance. "'Stop, I command you!' cried the wizard in an angry tone and at once began pulling down the rocks to liberate Jim and the piglets. Instead of opposing him in this, they stood back in silence, until he had made a good-sized hole in the barrier, when, by order of the princess, they all sprang forward and thrust out their sharp thorns. Dorothy hopped inside the opening to escape being pricked, and Zeb and the wizard, after enduring a few stabs from the thorns, were glad to follow her. At once the mangaboos began piling up the rocks of glass again, 
and as the little man realized that they were all about to be entombed in the mountain, he said to the children, "'My dears, what shall we do? Jump out and fight?' "'What's the use?' replied Dorothy. "'I'd as soon die here as live much longer among those cruel and heartless people.' "'That's the way I feel about it,' remarked Zeb, rubbing his wounds. "'I've had enough of the Mangaboos.' "'All right,' said the wizard. "'I'm with you, whatever you decide. "'But we can't live long in this cavern, that's certain.' Noticing that the light was growing dim, he picked up his nine piglets, patted each one lovingly on its fat little head, and placed them carefully in his inside pocket. Zeb struck a match and lighted one of the lanterns. The rays of the colored suns were now shut out from them forever, for the last chinks had been filled up in the wall that separated their prison from the land of the Mangaboos. "'How big is this hole?' asked Dorothy. "'I'll explore it and see,' replied the boy. So he carried the lantern back for quite a distance, while Dorothy and the wizard followed at his side. The cavern did not come to an end as they had expected it would, but slanted upward through the great glass mountain, running in a direction that promised to lead them to the side opposite the Mangaboo country. "'It isn't a bad road,' observed the wizard. And if we followed it, it might lead us to some place that is more comfortable than this black pocket we are now in. I suppose the vegetable folk were always afraid to enter this cavern because it is dark, but we have our lanterns to light the way, so I propose that we start out and discover where this tunnel in the mountain leads to. The others agreed readily to this sensible suggestion, and at once the boy began to harness Jim to the buggy. When all was in readiness, the three took their seats in the buggy, and Jim started cautiously along the way, Zeb driving while the wizard and Dorothy held each a lighted lantern so the horse could see where to go. Sometimes the tunnel was so narrow that the wheels of the buggy grazed the sides, then it would broaden out as wide as the street, but the floor was usually smooth, and for a long time they traveled on without any accident. Jim stopped sometimes to rest, for the climb was rather steep and tiresome. "'We must be nearly as high as the six colored suns by this time,' said Dorothy. "'I didn't know this mountain was so tall.' "'We are certainly a good distance away from the land of the Mangaboos,' added Zeb, "'for we have slanted away from it ever since we started.' But they kept on steadily moving, and as Jim was about tired out with his long journey— the way suddenly grew lighter, and Zeb put out the lanterns to save the oil. To their joy they found it was a white light that now greeted them, for all were weary of the colored rainbow lights which, after a time, had made their eyes ache with their constantly shifting rays. The sides of the tunnel showed before them like the inside of a long spyglass, and the floor became more level. Jim hastened his lagging steps at this assurance of a quick relief from the dark passage, and in a few moments more they had emerged from the mountain and found themselves face to face with a new and charming country. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum The Valley of Voices by journeying through the glass mountain, they had reached a delightful valley that was shaped like the hollow of a great cup, with another rugged mountain showing on the other side of it, and soft, pretty green hills at the ends. It was all laid out into lovely lawns and gardens, with pebble paths leading through them, and groves of beautiful and stately trees dotting the landscape here and there. There were orchards, too, bearing luscious fruits that are all unknown to our world. Alluring brooks of crystal water flowed sparkling between their flower-strewn banks, while scattered over the valley were dozens of the quaintest and most picturesque cottages our travelers had ever beheld. None of them were in clusters, such as villages or towns, but each had ample grounds of its own, with orchards and gardens surrounding it. As the new arrivals gazed upon this exquisite scene, 
They were enraptured by its beauties and the fragrance that permeated the soft air which they breathed so gratefully after the confined atmosphere of the tunnel. Several minutes were consumed in silent admiration before they noticed two very singular and unusual facts about this valley. One was that it was lighted from some unseen source, for no sun or moon was in the arched blue sky, although every object was flooded with a clear and perfect light. The second, and even more singular fact, was the absence of any inhabitant of this splendid place. From their elevated position they could overlook the entire valley, but not a single moving object could they see. All appeared mysteriously deserted. The mountain on this side was not glass, but made of stone similar to granite. With some difficulty and danger, Jim drew the buggy over the loose rocks until he reached the green lawns below, where the paths and orchards and gardens began. The nearest cottage was still some distance away. "'Isn't it fine?' cried Dorothy in a joyous voice, as she sprang out of the buggy and let Eureka run frolicking over the velvety grass. "'Yes, indeed,' answered Zeb. "'We were lucky to get away from those dreadful vegetable people.' "'It wouldn't be so bad,' remarked the wizard, gazing around him. "'If we were obliged to live here always, we couldn't find a prettier place, I'm sure.' He took the piglets from his pocket and let them run on the grass, and Jim tasted a mouthful of the green blades and declared he was very contented in his new surroundings. "'We can't walk in the air here, though,' called Eureka, who had tried it and failed. But the others were satisfied to walk on the ground, and the wizard said they must be nearer the surface of the earth than they had been in the Mangaboo country, for everything was more homelike and natural. "'But where are the people?' asked Dorothy. The little man shook his bald head. "'Can't imagine, my dear,' he replied. They heard the sudden twittering of a bird, but could not find the creature anywhere. Slowly they walked along the path toward the nearest cottage, the piglets racing and gambling beside them, and Jim pausing at every step for another mouthful of grass. Presently they came to a low plant which had broad spreading leaves, in the center of which grew a single fruit about as large as a peach. The fruit was so daintily colored and so fragrant, and looked so appetizing and delicious, that Dorothy stopped and exclaimed, What is this, do you suppose? The piglets had smelled the fruit quickly, and before the girl could reach out her hand to pluck it, every one of the nine tiny ones had rushed in and commenced to devour it with great eagerness. "'It's good, anyway,' said Zeb, or those little rascals wouldn't have gobbled it up so greedily. "'Where are they?' asked Dorothy in astonishment. They all looked around, but the piglets had disappeared. "'Dear me!' cried the wizard. "'They must have run away. But I didn't see them go, did you?' "'No.' replied the boy and the girl together. "'Here, picky, picky, picky!' called their master anxiously. Several squeals and grunts were instantly heard at his feet, but the wizard could not discover a single piglet. "'Where are you?' he asked. "'Why, right beside you!' spoke a tiny voice. "'Can't you see us?' "'No,' answered the little man in a puzzled tone. "'We can see you,' said another piglet. The wizard stooped down and put out his hand, and at once felt the small, fat body of one of his pets. He picked it up, but could not see what he held. "'It is very strange,' said he soberly. "'The piglets have become invisible in some curious way.' "'I'll bet it because they ate that peach,' cried the kitten. "'It wasn't a peach, Eureka,' said Dorothy. "'I only hope it wasn't poison.' "'It was fine, Dorothy,' called one of the piglets. "'We'll eat all we can find of them,' said another. "'But we mustn't eat them,' the wizard warned the children, "'or we, too, may become invisible and lose each other. "'If we come across another of the strange fruit, we must avoid it.' Calling the piglets to him, he picked them all up one by one and put them away in his pocket, for although he could not see them, he could feel them, and when he had buttoned his coat, he knew they were safe for the present. The travelers now resumed their walk toward the cottage, which they presently reached. It was a pretty place, with vines growing thickly over the broad front porch. 
The door stood open, and a table was set in the front room, with four chairs drawn up to it. On the table were plates and knives and forks and dishes of bread, meat, and fruits. The meat was smoking hot, and the knives and forks were performing strange antics and jumping here and there in quite a puzzling way. But not a single person appeared to be in the room. How funny! exclaimed Dorothy, who, with Zeb and the wizard, now stood in the doorway. A peal of merry laughter answered her, and the knives and forks fell to the plates with a clatter. One of the chairs pushed back from the table, and this was so astonishing and mysterious that Dorothy was almost tempted to run away in fright. "'Here are strangers, Mama," cried the shrill and childish voice of some unseen person. "'So I see, my dear.' answered another voice, soft and womanly. "'What do you want?' demanded a third voice, in a stern, gruff accent. "'Well, well,' said the wizard. "'Are there really people in this room?' "'Of course,' answered the man's voice. "'And, pardon me for the foolish question, but are you all invisible?' "'Surely,' the woman answered, repeating her low, rippling laughter. "'Are you surprised that you are unable to see the people of Bo?" "'Why, yes,' stammered the wizard. "'All the people I have ever met before were very plain to see.' "'Where do you come from, then?' asked the woman, in a curious tone. "'We belong upon the face of the earth,' explained the wizard. "'But recently, during an earthquake, we fell down a crack and landed in the country of the Mangaboos.' "'Dreadful creatures!' exclaimed the woman's voice. "'I've heard of them.' "'They walled us up in a mountain,' continued the wizard. But we found there was a tunnel through to this side, so we came here. It is a beautiful place. What do you call it? It is the Valley of Vaux. Thank you. We have seen no people since we arrived, so we came to this house to inquire our way. Are you hungry? asked the woman's voice. I could eat something, said Dorothy. So could I, added Zeb. But we do not wish to intrude, I assure you, the wizard hastened to say. "'That's all right,' returned the man's voice, more pleasantly than before. "'You are welcome to what we have.' As he spoke, the voice came so near to Zeb that he jumped back in alarm. Two childish voices laughed merrily at this action, and Dorothy was sure they were in no danger among such light-hearted folks, even if those folks couldn't be seen. "'What curious animal is that which is eating the grass on my lawn?' inquired the man's voice. "'That's Jim,' said the girl. "'He's a horse.' "'What's he good for?' was the next question. "'He draws the buggy you see fastened to him, and we ride in the buggy instead of walking,' she explained. "'Can he fight?' asked the man's voice. "'No, he can kick pretty hard with his heels, and bite a little, but Jim can't exactly fight,' she replied. "'Then the bears will get him,' said one of the children's voices. "'Bears!' exclaimed Dorothy. Are there bears here? This is the one evil of our country, answered the invisible man. Many large and fierce bears roam in the valley of Vaux, and when they catch any of us they eat us up. But as they cannot see us, we seldom get caught. Are the bears invisible, too? asked the girl. Yes, for they eat of the Dama fruit, as we all do, and that keeps them from being seen by any eye, whether human or animal. "'Does the Dama fruit grow on a low bush and look something like a peach?' asked the wizard. "'Yes,' was the reply. "'If it makes you invisible, why do you eat it?' Dorothy inquired. "'For two reasons, my dear,' the woman's voice answered. "'The Dama fruit is the most delicious thing that grows, and when it makes us invisible, the bears cannot find us to eat us up. But now, good wanderers, your luncheon is on the table, so please sit down and eat as much as you like.' End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum They Fight the Invisible Bears The strangers took their seats at the table willingly enough, for they were all hungry, and the platters were now heaped with good things to eat. In front of each place was a plate bearing one of the delicious Dama fruit, and the perfume that rose from these was so enticing and sweet that they were sorely tempted to eat of them and become invisible. 
But Dorothy satisfied her hunger with other things, and her companions did likewise, resisting the temptation. "'Why do you not eat the damas?' asked the woman's voice. "'We don't want to get invisible,' answered the girl. "'But if you remain visible, the bears will see you and devour you,' said a girlish young voice, that belonged to one of the children. "'We who live here much prefer to be invisible, for we can still hug and kiss one another, and are quite safe from the bears.' "'And we do not have to be so particular about our dress,' remarked the man. "'And Mama can't tell whether my face is dirty or not,' added the other childish voice gleefully. "'But I make you wash it every time I think of it,' said the mother. "'For it stands to reason your face is dirty, Ayanu, whether I can see it or not.' Dorothy laughed and stretched out her hands. "'Come here, please, Ayanu, and your sister, and let me feel of you,' she requested. They came to her willingly, and Dorothy passed her hands over their faces and forms, and decided one was a girl of about her own age, and the other a boy somewhat smaller. The girl's hair was soft and fluffy, and her skin as smooth as satin. When Dorothy gently touched her nose and ears and lips, they seemed to be well and delicately formed. "'If I could see you, I am sure you would be beautiful,' she declared. The girl laughed, and her mother said, "'We are not vain in the Valley of Voe, because we cannot display our beauty, and good actions and pleasant ways are what make us lovely to our companions. Yet we can see and appreciate the beauties of nature, the dainty flowers and trees, the green fields, and the clear blue of the sky.' "'How about the birds and beasts and fishes?' asked Zeb. The birds we cannot see, because they love to eat of the damas as much as we do. Yet we hear their sweet songs and enjoy them. Neither can we see the cruel bears, for they also eat the fruit. But the fishes that swim in our brooks we can see, and often we catch them to eat. It occurs to me you have a great deal to make you happy, even while invisible, remarked the wizard. Nevertheless, we prefer to remain visible while we are in your valley. Just then Eureka came in, for she had been until now wandering outside with Jim, and when the kitten saw the table set with food, she cried out, Now you must feed me, Dorothy, for I'm half starved. The children were inclined to be frightened by the sight of the small animal, which reminded them of the bears. But Dorothy reassured them by explaining that Eureka was a pet and could do no harm even if she wished to. Then, as the others had by this time moved away from the table, the kitten sprang upon the chair and put her paws upon the cloth to see what there was to eat. To her surprise an unseen hand clutched her and held her suspended in the air. Eureka was frantic with terror and tried to scratch and bite so the next moment she was dropped to the floor. "'Did you see that, Dorothy?' she gasped. "'Yes, dear,' her mistress replied. "'There are people living in this house, although we cannot see them. And you must have better manners, Eureka, or something worse will happen to you.' She placed a plate of food upon the floor, and the kitten ate greedily. "'Give me that nice-smelling food I saw on the table,' she begged, when she had cleaned the plate. Those are damas, said Dorothy, and you must never even taste them, Eureka, or you'll get invisible, and then we can't see you at all. The kitten gazed wistfully at the forbidden fruit. Does it hurt to be invisible? she asked. I don't know, Dorothy answered, but it would hurt me dreadfully to lose you. Very well, I won't touch it, decided the kitten. But you must keep it away from me, for the smell is very tempting. Can you tell us, sir or madam, said the wizard, addressing the air, because he did not quite know where the unseen people stood, if there is any way we can get out of your beautiful valley and on top of the earth again? Oh, one can leave the valley easily enough, answered the man's voice. But to do so you must enter a far less pleasant country. As for reaching the top of the earth, I have never heard that it is possible to do that, and if you succeed in getting there, you would probably fall off. Oh, no, said Dorothy, we've been there, and we know. 
The Valley of Voe is certainly a charming place, resumed the wizard, but we cannot be contented in any other land than our own for long. Even if we should come to unpleasant places on our way, it is necessary, in order to reach the earth's surface, to keep moving on toward it. In that case, said the man, it will be best for you to cross our valley and mount the spiral staircase inside the Pyramid Mountain. The top of that mountain is lost in the clouds, and when you reach it you will be in the awful land of Nought, where the gargoyles live. What are gargoyles? asked Zeb. I do not know, young sir. Our greatest champion, Overman Anu, once climbed the spiral stairway and fought nine days with the gargoyles before he could escape them and come back. But he could never be induced to describe the dreadful creatures, and soon afterward a bear caught him and ate him up. The wanderers were rather discouraged by this gloomy report, but Dorothy said with a sigh, if the only way to get home is to meet the gurgles, then we've got to meet them. They can't be worse than the Wicked Witch or the Gnome King. But you must remember you had the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman to help you conquer those enemies, suggested the wizard. Just now, my dear, there is not a single warrior in your company. Oh, I guess Zeb could fight if he had to, couldn't you, Zeb? asked the little girl. Perhaps, if I had to answered Zeb doubtfully. And you have the jointed sword that you chopped the vegetable sorcerer into with, the girl said to the little man. True, he replied, and in my satchel are other useful things to fight with. What the gargoyles most dread is a noise, said the man's voice. Our champion told me that when he shouted his battle cry, the creatures shuddered and drew back, hesitating to continue the combat. But they were in great numbers, and the champion could not shout much, because he had to save his breath for fighting. "'Very good,' said the wizard. "'We can all yell better than we can fight, so we ought to defeat the gargoyles.' "'But tell me,' said Dorothy, "'how did such a brave champion happen to let the bears eat him? And if he was invisible and the bears invisible, who knows that they really ate him up?' The champion had killed eleven bears in his time, returned the unseen man, and we know this is true because when any creature is dead, the invisible charm of the Dama fruit ceases to be active, and the slain one can be plainly seen by all eyes. When the champion killed a bear, everyone could see it, and when the bears killed the champion, we all saw several pieces of him scattered about which, of course, disappeared again when the bears devoured them. They now bade farewell to the kind but unseen people of the cottage, and after the man had called their attention to a high pyramid-shaped mountain on the opposite side of the valley, and told them how to travel in order to reach it, they again started upon their journey. They followed the course of a broad stream, and passed several more pretty cottages, but of course they saw no one, nor did anyone speak to them. Fruits and flowers grew plentifully all about, and there were many of the delicious damas that the people of Vo were so fond of. About noon they stopped to allow Jim to rest in the shade of a pretty orchard, and while they plucked and ate some of the cherries and plums that grew there, a soft voice suddenly said to them, "'There are bears nearby.' Be careful. The wizard got out his sword at once, and Zeb grabbed the horsewhip. Dorothy climbed into the buggy, although Jim had been unharnessed from it and was grazing some distance away. The owner of the unseen voice laughed lightly and said, You cannot escape the bears that way. How can we escape? asked Dorothy nervously, for an unseen danger is always the hardest to face. You must take the river, was the reply. The bears will not venture upon the water. But we would be drowned, exclaimed the girl. Oh, there is no need of that, said the voice, which from its gentle tones seemed to belong to a young girl. You are strangers in the Valley of Vaux, and do not seem to know our ways, so I will try to save you. The next moment a broad-leafed plant was jerked from the ground where it grew, 
and held suspended in the air before the wizard. Sir, said the voice, you must rub these leaves upon the soles of all your feet, and then you will be able to walk upon the water without sinking below the surface. It is a secret the bears do not know, and we people of Vo usually walk upon the water when we travel, and so escape our enemies. Thank you, cried the wizard joyfully, and at once rubbed a leaf upon the soles of Dorothy's shoes, and then upon his own. The girl took a leaf and rubbed it upon the kitten's paws, and the rest of the plant was handed to Zeb, who, after applying it to his own feet, carefully rubbed it upon all four of Jim's hooves, and then upon the tires of the buggy wheels. He had nearly finished this last task, when a low growling was suddenly heard, and the horse began to jump around and kick viciously with his heels. "'Quick, to the water, or you are lost!' cried the unseen friend, and without hesitation the wizard drew the buggy down the bank and out upon the broad river, for Dorothy was still seated in it, with Eureka in her arms. They did not sink at all, owing to the virtues of the strange plant they had used, and when the buggy was in the middle of the stream the wizard returned to the bank to assist Zeb and Jim. The horse was plunging madly about, and two or three deep gashes appeared upon its flanks, from which the blood flowed freely. "'Run for the river!' shouted the wizard, and Jim quickly freed himself from his unseen tormentors by a few vicious kicks, and then obeyed. As soon as he trotted out upon the surface of the river, he found himself safe from pursuit, and Zeb was already running across the water toward Dorothy. As the little wizard turned to follow them, he felt a hot breath against his cheek, and heard a low, fierce growl. At once he began stabbing in the air with his sword, and he knew that he had struck some substance, because when he drew back the blade it was dripping with blood. The third time that he thrust out the weapon there was a loud roar and a fall, and suddenly at his feet appeared the form of a great red bear, which was nearly as big as the horse, and much stronger and fiercer. The beast was quite dead from the sword thrusts, and after a glance at its terrible claws and sharp teeth, the little man turned in a panic and rushed out upon the water, for other menacing growls told him more bears were near. On the river, however, the adventurers seemed to be perfectly safe. Dorothy and the buggy had floated slowly downstream with the current of the water, and the others made haste to join her. The wizard opened his satchel and got out some sticking plaster, with which he mended the cuts Jim had received from the claws of the bears. "'I think we'd better stick to the river after this,' said Dorothy. "'If our unknown friend hadn't warned us and told us what to do, we would all be dead by this time.' "'That is true,' agreed the wizard. And as the river seems to be flowing in the direction of the Pyramid Mountain, it will be the easiest way for us to travel. Zeb hitched Jim to the buggy again, and the horse trotted along and drew them rapidly over the smooth water. The kitten was at first dreadfully afraid of getting wet, but Dorothy let her down, and soon Eureka was frisking along beside the buggy without being scared a bit. Once a little fish swam too near the surface, and the kitten grabbed it in her mouth and ate it up as quick as a wink. But Dorothy cautioned her to be careful what she ate in this valley of enchantments, and no more fishes were careless enough to swim within reach. After a journey of several hours they came to a point where the river curved, and they found they must cross a mile or so of the valley before they came to the Pyramid Mountain. There were few houses in this part, and few orchards or flowers, so our friends feared they might encounter more of the savage bears, which they had learned to dread with all their hearts. "'You'll have to make a dash, Jim,' said the wizard, "'and run as fast as you can go.' "'All right,' answered the horse. "'I'll do my best. But you must remember I'm old, and my dashing days are past and gone.' All three got into the bucky, and Zeb picked up the reins, though Jim needed no guidance of any sort. The horse was still smarting from the sharp claws of the invisible bears, 
and as soon as he was on land and headed toward the mountain, the thought that more of those fearsome creatures might be near acted as a spur and sent him galloping along in a way that made Dorothy catch her breath. Then Zeb, in a spirit of mischief, uttered a growl like that of the bears, and Jim picked up his ears and fairly flew. His bony legs moved so fast they could scarcely be seen, and the wizard clung fast to the seat and yelled, Whoa! at the top of his voice. I'm, I'm afraid he's, he's running away, gasped Dorothy. I know he is, said Zeb, but no bear can catch him if he keeps up that gait, and the harness or the buggy don't break. Jim did not make a mile a minute, but almost before they were aware of it, he drew up at the foot of the mountain so suddenly that the wizard and Zeb both sailed over the dashboard and landed in the soft grass, where they rolled over several times before they stopped. Dorothy nearly went with them, but she was holding fast to the iron rail of the seat, and that saved her. She squeezed the kitten, though, until it screeched, and then the old cab-horse made several curious sounds that led the little girl to suspect he was laughing at them all. End of Chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum The Braided Man of Pyramid Mountain The mountain before them was shaped like a cone, and was so tall that its point was lost in the clouds. Directly facing the place where Jim had stopped was an arched opening leading to a broad stairway. The stairs were cut in the rock inside the mountain, and they were broad and not very steep, because they circled around like a corkscrew and at the arched opening where the flight began the circle was quite big. At the foot of the stairs was a sign reading, Warning, these steps lead to the land of the gargoyles. Danger, keep out. I wonder how Jim is ever going to draw the buggy up so many stairs, said Dorothy gravely. No trouble at all, declared the horse with a contemptuous neigh. Still, I don't care to drag any passengers. You'll all have to walk. "'Suppose the stairs get steeper,' suggested Zeb doubtfully. "'Then you'll have to boost the buggy wheels, that's all,' answered Jim. "'We'll try it anyway,' said the wizard. "'It's the only way to get out of the Valley of Vaux.' So they began to ascend the stairs, Dorothy and the wizard first, Jim next, drawing the buggy, and then Zeb to watch that nothing happened to the harness. The light was dim, and soon they mounted into total darkness, so that the wizard was obliged to get out his lanterns to light the way. But this enabled them to proceed steadily until they came to a landing where there was a rift in the side of the mountain that let in both light and air. Looking through this opening, they could see the Valley of Vaux lying far below them, the cottages seeming like toy houses from that distance. After resting a few moments they resumed their climb, and still the stairs were broad and low enough for Jim to drag the buggy easily after him. The old horse panted a little and had to stop often to get his breath. At such times they were all glad to wait for him, for continually climbing up stairs is sure to make one's legs ache. They wound about, always going upward for some time. The lights from the lanterns dimly showed the way. But it was a gloomy journey, and they were pleased when a broad streak of light ahead assured them they were coming to a second landing. Here one side of the mountain had a great hole in it, like the mouth of a cavern, and the stairs stopped at the near edge of the floor, and commenced ascending again at the opposite edge. The opening in the mountain was on the side opposite to the Valley of Vaux, and our travelers looked out upon a strange scene. Below them was a vast space, at the bottom of which was a black sea with rolling billows, through which little tongues of flame constantly shot up. Just above them, and almost on a level with their platform, were banks of rolling clouds, which constantly shifted position and changed color. The blues and grays were very beautiful, and Dorothy noticed that on the cloud banks sat or reclined fleecy, shadowy forms of beautiful things who must have been the cloud fairies. 
Mortals who stand upon the earth and look up at the sky cannot often distinguish these forms, but our friends were now so near to the clouds that they observed the dainty fairies very clearly. "'Are they real?' asked Zeb in an awed voice. "'Of course,' replied Dorothy softly. "'They are the cloud fairies.' "'They seem like open work,' remarked the boy, gazing intently. "'If I should squeeze one, there wouldn't be anything left of it.' In the open space between the clouds and the black bubbling sea far beneath could be seen an occasional strange bird winging its way swiftly through the air. These birds were of enormous size, and reminded Zeb of the rocks he had read about in the Arabian Nights. They had fierce eyes and sharp talons and beaks, and the children hoped none of them would venture into the cavern. "'Well, I declare!' suddenly exclaimed the little wizard. What in the world is this? They turned around and found a man standing on the floor in the center of the cave, who bowed very politely when he saw he had attracted their attention. He was a very old man, bent nearly double, but the queerest thing about him was his white hair and beard. These were so long that they reached to his feet, and both the hair and the beard were carefully plaited into many braids, and the end of each braid fastened with a bow of colored ribbon. "'Where did you come from?' asked Dorothy wonderingly. "'No place at all,' answered the man with the braids. "'That is, not recently. Once I lived on top the earth, but for many years I have had my factory in this spot, halfway up Pyramid Mountain.' "'Are we only halfway up?' inquired the boy in a discouraged tone. "'I believe so, my lad,' replied the braided man. "'But as I have never been in either direction down or up since I arrived, I cannot be positive whether it is exactly halfway or not.' "'Have you a factory in this place?' asked the wizard, who had been examining the strange personage carefully. "'To be sure,' said the other. "'I am a great inventor, you must know, and I manufacture my products in this lonely spot.' "'What are your products?' inquired the wizard. "'Well, I make assorted flutters for flags and bunting, and a superior grade of rustles for ladies' silk gowns.' "'I thought so,' said the wizard with a sigh. "'May we examine some of these articles?' "'Yes, indeed. Come into my shop, please.' And the braided man turned and led the way into a smaller cave, where he evidently lived. Here, on a broad shelf were several cardboard boxes of various sizes, each tied with cotton cord. This, said the man, taking up a box and handling it gently, contains twelve dozen rustles, enough to last any lady a year. Will you buy it, my dear? he asked, addressing Dorothy. My gown isn't silk, she said, smiling. Never mind. When you open the box, the rustles will escape whether you are wearing a silk dress or not said the man seriously. Then he picked up another box. In this, he continued, are many assorted flutters. They are invaluable to make flags flutter on a still day when there is no wind. You, sir, turning to the wizard, ought to have this assortment. Once you have tried my goods, I am sure you will never be without them. I have no money with me, said the wizard evasively. I do not want money returned the braided man, for I could not spend it in this deserted place if I had it. But I would like very much a blue hair ribbon. You will notice my braids are tied with yellow, pink, brown, red, green, white, and black. But I have no blue ribbons. I'll get you one, cried Dorothy, who was sorry for the poor man. So she ran back to the buggy and took from her suitcase a pretty blue ribbon. It did her good to see how the braided man's eyes sparkled when he received this treasure. "'You have made me very, very happy, my dear,' he exclaimed, and then he insisted on the wizard taking the box of flutters and the little girl accepting the box of rustles. "'You may need them some time,' he said, "'and there is really no use in my manufacturing these things unless somebody uses them.' "'Why did you leave the surface of the earth?' inquired the wizard. I could not help it. It is a sad story, but if you will try to restrain your tears, I will tell you about it. 
On earth I was a manufacturer of imported holes of American Swiss cheese, and I will acknowledge that I supplied a superior article which was in great demand. Also I made pores for porous plasters, and high-grade holes for doughnuts and buttons. Finally I invented a new adjustable post hole, which I thought would make my fortune. I manufactured a large quantity of these post holes, and having no room in which to store them, I set them all end to end and put the top one in the ground. That made an extraordinarily long hole, as you may imagine, and reached far down into the earth, and as I leaned over it to try to see to the bottom, I lost my balance and tumbled in. Unfortunately, the hole led directly into the vast space you see outside this mountain. But I managed to catch a point of rock that projected from this cavern, and so saved myself from tumbling headlong into the black waves beneath, where the tongues of flame that dart out would certainly have consumed me. Here, then, I make my home, and although it is a lonely place, I amuse myself making rustles and flutters, and so get along very nicely. When the braided man had completed this strange tale, Dorothy nearly laughed because it was all so absurd, but the wizard tapped his forehead significantly to indicate that he thought the poor man was crazy. So they politely bade him good day and went back to the outer cavern to resume their journey. End of chapter 10